who has a real solution to be sure to have pipeline in this country. It's a little bit more risky in Quebec, but when I told you in the beginning that I want to appeal to your intelligence, not to your emotion, and my role as a politician is to, it is to speak about that, knowing that you have to explain that a little bit more in Quebec, but I understand that they will understand that. And actually, about 50%, 55% of Quebecers want to buy their oil and gas from Western Canada. So you need to inform the population a little bit more, and that's our role, and that's my role as a politician. So that's a big distinction between us and Shir. I'm saying the same thing in French and English, and uh, when I'm speaking about that, it's all over the news. Burmese for pipelines because the leftist media think that they're going to print that and that will hurt us and I won't have a lot of support. But they are helping me because they are speaking about pipeline. And when I said that, I received a lot of calls from radio station. Bernier, you're for pipelines in Quebec. You're against the Quebec government, your own government. I said yes. And I had a lot of opportunities to be on radio station and, and television in French to speak about that. That was a huge opportunity, and I'm doing that each time I have a question about that in Quebec and outside Quebec. So I know that's important here, but that's important for every community. Thank you. Uh, next question. What do you see as the main driver behind the UN, and why is there such a push for a one world government? Yeah, the UN. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's all about, uh, it, it's all about the elites in the UN, and also the fact that it's a transfer of wealth from the rich country to the poor country. You know, we can do that, but that would be under a Canadian decision by a Canadian government. And we are doing that in our foreign aid policy in Canada. We are helping other countries, and that's okay. But having a, a UN that is uh, imposing to us some of their views, like the climate change issue that we just discussed, we won't sign the climate change agreement. We won't do anything at the federal level to fight climate change because the environment is a shared jurisdiction and a province can do it if they want to do it. So all these kind of pet projects, socialist pet projects by the UN, we won't be part of them. But yes, Canada will be part of the UN, but we'll look at all the spending that we're doing with the UN and we'll do an analysis if we if if what we're doing with the UN it's in line with our values and our principles. So no no uh, uh, Paris Accord agreement. We will fight for the environment <coughs> concrete reform and concrete actions like having more of our lake. We still have lake of our pollution. We need to have clear lake, clear river, clear land and we'll do something very concrete on that. It's not normal that in Montreal and Vancouver, these two cities are putting their sewage in the St. Lawrence River and in the ocean. We need to do something, and it's easy work in 2019, we can do something concrete for the environment. But climate change, I leave that to provinces. Like in Quebec, right now in my own province, the carbon tax won't apply to Quebecers because in Quebec, the, the Quebec government has a cap and trade system. So if a province wants to deal with climate change, that would be their choice. But for us, the most important, we won't impose a carbon tax, we won't impose more regulation on businesses. So that's important. So that, uh, that uh, Paris Accord, we won't be part of that. And about the UN, the other thing is the UN Migration Compact. So, you know, we are a sovereign country. I don't want a, our immigration policy to be written by a diplomat or a bureaucrat in, uh, in New York. The Trudeau government said, we believe in the migration compact and we signed the migration compact. And after that, they were saying, you know, 
but it's not binding, it's okay. So why signing an agreement if you don't want to apply that agreement? Yes, it's not binding, but the Trudeau government, the Canadian government, will change our legislation on immigration to be in line with what the UN wants. And for us, our immigration policy must be dealt in Canada by Canadians for Canadians. Yeah. And But also right now, Sheer and Trudeau said that it's so important for Canada to have a seat at the UN Security Council. So Trudeau is campaigning right now. He's campaigning with your money. He's giving money to other countries and in Africa and other countries around the world to have their vote to, for Canada to be at the UN Security Council. And she said, I'll do the same thing. I will campaign. I want Canada to have a seat at the UN Security Council. And when you say, when you're speaking about campaigning, it's about taking your money and giving that to another government to be sure that we'll be able to have a seat over there. For us, we won't campaign. We won't try to have a seat at the UN Security Council. And we will save a lot of money like the $2.3 billion that the Trudeau government is giving to African countries to fight climate change. He's not doing that because he, want, he wants them to fight climate change. He's doing that because he wants them to vote for him at the UN Security Council. And between you and me, do you believe that these African countries, a dictatorship African countries, will use the money to fight climate change? I doubt it. So we save money over there, and our relationship with the UN will be at the minimum because we want to put our country first and we don't believe in a supranational organization that will tell us what to do with your country. $2.65 billion, I bet. Two point, two point, okay. Well, we did the math, of, and I had this come up in the debate. I was debating, and uh, I think it was maybe an event at the Sarnia at the uh, Rosary debate. I'm not sure, but we talked about low-income housing, and I made the statement: there's uh, 338 ridings in the country, and the amount of money that was given out could have given each riding eight million dollars. And everybody complains about low-income housing. I'll get back on that because it's an issue in this community. Well. Why don't you get on him about that? He said, that much money, with one stroke of the pen, our tax dollars, and we have veterans, we have people who are have the least among us that he's not taking care of. And there's people still willing to vote liberal. To me, I don't understand that. When, you, when you're sending that much money out, and, you're, and, and we could have had eight million. And, and you know, that's a big amount of money when you're dealing with nothing. Right? So, and that's 338 ridings across the country. Like, that's insane. There's some ridings that might not have an issue. They might have been able to get extra money into Sarnia Landon. Like, nobody wants to talk about that stuff because since the money went out for global war or climate change, since the money went out for that, shh, don't say anything about it because if you do, CBC, there they'll be, but Everett said this about climate change, and the next thing you know. So that's what I'm saying, and that's the type of politician I am, is I'm factual. I, can, I just kept on saying it. Like, that money should have stayed in Canada to help Canadians that are in need. We need to take care of Canadians first, and I believe Maxine Bernie is on that very same page. Thank you. Uh, next question is on supply management. I think you touched on it a little bit. Um, can you explain to us how it works and uh, what your thoughts are about it? Yeah, shortly, because I think everybody knows that it is a, a big cartel. So, ending supply management, it's a win, win, win. Starting by Canadian consumers, it would be a win because we're going to save uh, $400, $400 a year, like I said, and uh, we're going to pay half the price for meal, put in it. And so that's a win for Canadian consumers. That's a win also for these producers. The milk, 
dairy and chicken and uh, eggs producers in Canada. Because right now, under that cartel, they have the obligation to produce only for the Canadian market, and they are fixing high artificial prices for these products. So they will be able to export and will, will give them the right to export. And I know that they are producing excellent products. They will be able to export, like our beef, our, our, chick, our, our beef, our, our pork uh, producers that they are exporting right now. So these producers, under the cartel of supply management, they represent only 10% of the producers, or 10% of the farmers in this country. 90% of the farmers are under a free market and they can export. So it's not fair. So that would be fair. They would be able to export. But first, first sorry, we will have to buy back their quota. That's important. They will take that money. They will take that money to be more productive. And after a transition period of five years, we'll let them uh, the right to export. And that's another win for uh, our American colleague and uh, President Trump and for our, our, for our relationship with the U.S. Why? We don't have a free trade agreement, a signed free trade agreement with the U.S. right now. And you remember that President Trump <coughs> were asking during the negotiation, Canada to put on the table the abolition of the cartel in Milbury and Putri. The Liberals government and, and Andrew Scheer and the, all the other leaders didn't want to put that to put that on the table. We will, we will say to President Trump, we want to have a good relationship with you. It will be good for our Kenyan consumers. We want your producers, your, your poultry, eggs, and dairy producers to be able to export in Canada. And Canadian consumers will have the freedom to choose if they want to buy milk from Canada or milk from the US. So we want to put that on the table because we know that's a big ask from the American government. And we're going to be able to say, this is on the table, so give us something. And we'll start the negotiation like that, and I'm sure we'll be able to have a better deal with the US. So abolishing that, it's a win-win-win for everybody. You just have to do that in the right way. And if, it, if that system, like the dairy producer are saying, it's the best system in the world, why we are the only country on this planet who's having a system like that? It is a socialist system that Pierre Elliott Trudeau brought in more than 45 years ago. And he had to suppose a free market uh, political party, the conservative party, supposed to be for the free market, and they are for keeping a socialist system for milk, dairy, and poultry. So let's get rid of that, and that will be, that will be I think, the only policy to help Canadian families in this country. Thanks. Lee Atkins as well from Lenta Ken Middlesex. We've been cruising around here in Chatham this morning. And we talked about, uh, there's recently uh, someone on the spy, $30,000 for smuggling 8,000 pounds of cheese into Ontario. Like, uh, we've created a, a literal black market in it. We see it with what we've done with other things in society that way. And, and i got to say, I really wonder, on a border town, and not just Sarnia, but you go up in uh, Niagara Falls, a different border town, are we, do we have American products? In our restaurants? Who knows? They're a lot cheaper. So what we're doing is we're putting a thing in place where we're allowing some people to cheat too. So I'm not saying it's going on, but everybody's trying to talk about, oh well, all this stuff in our milk. And, no, it's true, but all this stuff in our milk and you know, they talk about American dairy with steroids in it and this and that. Well, a lot of that stuff comes out of uh, uh, talk from, from the lobbyists uh, from the dairy cartel that Max was talking about. So there's a lot of hype in that. Like I, I went tight, we were over at Shannon, my uh, girl and I were over in Kroger the other day, we were over in the States, and I looked at one of the containers. And it said that they don't use uh, any steroids in their in their milk. Like, do I believe them? I don't know, but I, one thing I wouldn't want to see 
is anything um, uh, loosened up. Like uh, we do have a quality product here in Barrie, and, and I think the people need to know that as well. That if the United States was going to be bringing their dairy into Canada, they'd have to meet our standards, and there'd be no breaks in that. And I think that in reality, a lot of it already does. I, and I think it's just the lobbyists that are, are telling us it doesn't, and it's the big fear, fear game going on. But uh, that's about it with me. I, 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 I had a hard time with supply management. Uh, when I right before the platform, we talked about this as well. I said, geez, that really looks like it's coming down on the farmer. But I gotta tell you, I just brought five yard signs out to a beef farmer who's given them to his buddies. Because the, cat, the beef farmers, he actually said to me, he said, Brian, I get to raise my animals. He said, and I send them to slaughter. He said, these guys get to keep it. And they get subsidized to do it. He said, I'm struggling with what I do to keep food on my table. And he said, there's no benefits for me. And I, I brought up the fact that, like, how would everybody in here feel about paying 50 bucks for a $15 steak? We could do it. We could shut down the borders for any other beef. We could say, let's, su let's supplement uh, the price and, and cheat on the price and fix it for the Canadian beef farmer. And a $15 steak will cost you 50. And everybody doesn't want to do that, right? Everybody gets mad at that. But make no mistake about it. That extra seven dollars for three liters of milk, that goes a long way for someone with a family and, and four kids trying to feed their family. Supply management does. Everyone wants to help people on the lower end of the income scale. Well, let's put our money where our mouth is then. We can do it. And and I'm all for it because I know like what twenty dollars to me might not be, you know, it's not gonna kill me. But there's people that are living on a shoestring budget in this community. And I know that, and anything we can do to help them, and, and I believe supply management helps them. So that's why I'm, I'm back in getting rid of supply management. But also, if I may add on supply management, uh, you have a lot of uh, uh, other producers, like beef producers here, mm -hmm. but that's unfair for them, because when our country signed a free trade agreement, and I'll give you the example with, with uh, Japan, the Japanese want to sell us their milk, poultry, and eggs. But because of that system, we we'll say, no, no, you don't have the right. No import in Canada. The market is only for Canadian producers, like we said. So because of that, the Japanese government will say at the, the negotiation table, okay, you'll be able to export your beef, but you'll have a quota because we cannot export our milk, poultry, and eggs. So that's unfair for these producers because they don't have the full access to another market. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. Um, Max, recently you said that one of the first things that you would like to do as PM would be to ensure healthy drinking water for our First Nations. Why is that important to you? Yeah, it is important because it is a shame that there is no clear uh, running water on some reserve. So, and it's a shame also that other leaders don't have a policy for First Nation. And you can go on our, on our website, People's Party of Canada, let's see, and you'll be able to find our policy. So what we want to do, we want first of all to respect the treaty that we signed with them. Second, to be sure that it is not a top-down approach from Ottawa, Ottawa knows better than people on the ground, than the First Nation. And right now, it is the case. So we need to give them more autonomy and more responsibility. We believe in individual freedom and personal responsibility. That must be the same thing for the First Nation. So we need to change the system. We need to be sure that on reserve, they will have a kind of a property right. So they will be able to have a house, mortgage a house, and that's the basic of a capitalist society. So kind of a property rights on the reserve, but also we need to repeal the Indian Act. So repeal that, it's a paternalistic legislation. And First Nations and, and uh, Aboriginal uh, people agree with that. They agree with that, that we must repeal the Indian Act. But the question is, we're gonna replace that by what? So, what we are saying to the First Nation, we have a path, a road, 
to a better future for them, but that's only the beginning. So we have some principles that we want to follow. We want you to be more uh, independent from the government. We want you to be able to have kind of a public right on reserve. We want you also to be uh, as equal as other Canadians. We will respect your treaty. So that's uh, our principal approach to the reform for our First Nation. And, and we want to start that discussion with them. And uh, it's too important that uh, we, need, we need to have that discussion as soon as possible. Uh, um, uh, to add to that, you know, I know, I don't know if everybody was watching, um, there was this big fundraiser and Justin Trudeau was doing this big fundraiser and there was an Aboriginal woman from uh, Grass and Morals, I believe, and she came in to do a protest and she protested it. And, the, and he had the audacity to say, oh, thank you for your donation. And to me, that was classic Trudeau at his most truthful and realistic appearance. He's in amongst his big dinner donors, the 1500 bucks a plate, and he's saying that to an Aboriginal woman. What are the odds of getting anything done for me? And I'm, I'm hoping that uh, people pay attention to that. Um, because it, it speaks volumes to me. And I, I think I, I would like to see that with the PPC move towards fixing that water. Like when you have people, um, they're pr practically begging and it's been going on for years and years. They've been promised, there's a big list of reserves. It's massive. It's, a, it's, it's crazy that in this country, in Canada, that that has went on. And, and it's totally disrespectful to the Aboriginal communities. And I'm, I'm counting on you, Max. Um, to fix that, to, to help them and get that done. Okay. Trudeau, I'm like, very quick to apologize for everything, mm -hmm. but on that file, we are still looking for action. That's right, that's right. Hey, okay, thank you. Um, next question is about the Multicultural Act. It sounds like a nice thing to have. Can you uh, tell us a bit about the history and uh, what's the PPC's plan for? Yeah, quickly, first of all, we don't need a legislation to tell us who we are. We know that Canada is a diverse country founded by Francophone, Anglophone, First Nation, Inuit, immigrants from all over the world. We know that we are a diverse country. The Multiculturalism Act, it's the only there for the government to promote our diversity. What we want to do, we want to promote what unites us. We want to celebrate our history. We want to celebrate our culture. We want to celebrate our country. But when Justin Trudeau is saying diversity is our strength, I'm saying the opposite. What unites us is our strength, and we must celebrate that. So no more, we don't need a multiculturalism act. We will repeal that. But at the same time, the federal government right now is funding every um, celebration of our diversity with your money. We want to stop that. I'll give you an example. If you're a Canadian from Chinese origin, that's okay. But for me, you're not a Chinese Canadian. You're a Canadian first from Chinese origin. All the other politicians, you know, you're a Hindu Canadian, Pakistanese Canadian, Chinese Canadian, so no, you must change your vocabulary. We are all Canadians, and yes, if I have a Canadians from Chinese origin that want to celebrate the Chinese year, that's okay. They are free to do it, but I don't want the government to sponsor that. That's the big difference. <laughs> sponsor the celebration that speak about our history and who we are as Canadians and North American and so so that's that's why no need for the multiculturalism act and and we'll save some money about the, all the money that is going to different celebration of uh, our diversity as a country we know that we are a diverse country that's okay that's perfect but let's go on and try to celebrate what unites us and we'll feel like that a freer and a more prosperous country.
Uh, we'll do a few more questions and then open it up to the audience. Um, next question is on uh, free markets and uh, competition and what the role of government plays in that. Our goal is a limited government, less government in your day-to-day -day life. We believe in you. We believe that you know better than the government what to do in your own life. So we want to give you more of your own money in your own pocket. That's important. I don't believe that the government has the solution to every challenges that we have in society. And I believe that we must respect the Constitution. It's very well written. There's a provincial jurisdiction and federal jurisdiction. We must not interfere in provincial jurisdiction. And the opposite is true also. Provincial government must not interfere in our federal jurisdiction. So yes, a limited government, a government that will be responsible. And also, we need to have more competition in this country. I'll give you an example. All the other leaders are speaking about your uh, cell phone bill. Uh, it's very expensive and we must do something. But the best thing to do for that, it is more competition. You know, we have Bell, Tillis, Rogers, and we still have legislation in Canada against foreign investment in the telecom industry. So we must abolish that, and like that, we'll have a foreign telecom corporation from the US or another country that would be able to come here and to compete against Bell, Tillis, and the big players. And when you know, when you have more competition, you have a better product, and you have lower prices. So, and I think these corporations will have a huge incentive to come and compete here because we think that with a, a little lack of competition, the price is very high right now in Canada. And they will come here, they will be able to compete and, and be profitable at the same time. So that's the real solution for the telecom industry, more competition. So yes, we believe in a free market, and we believe in the same playing field for every industry, uh, and, and that's, uh, that's part of uh, our philosophy more free markets, less government intervention, and, and at the end, you know, it will be, uh, consumers will have more choices, and that would be better for everybody. Thank you. I, I think, you know, Mark, I'll touch on that. It's the same thing with the, like you talked about supply management, and that plays into the same thing. Like I, I, I told Shannon the other day, I said, you know, I can't buy 20 cows and, and, and produce milk. I'm not allowed to do it. Like I get fined and charged. Like that to me is not a Canadian thing. So that, that getting rid of supply management also comes into that free market that I just want to yeah. Thank you. Um, next question is on uh, Canadian politics as a whole. You say you want to do politics differently. So how do we move from the current system which is based on pandering to special interest groups and identity politics to a system where everyone is actually treated equally? <laughs> <laughs> because we are the only one, the only party who's doing that differently. You know, I'm in Ontario here. I was in Calgary. I always have the same question. What will you do for our province? What will you do for our community? Quebec. So my answer is always the same. Nothing special, you know. Nothing special. Our policies are good for every region in this country, for every Canadian. And that's the same thing. If I have uh, uh, the, I don't know, a special interest group that, that wants a special privilege, they won't with us. So we, our goal is, we are the people's party, is to look at polit politics differently. And we don't try to, to please everyone, and we are telling the truth. If you try to please everybody, you end up pleasing nobody. And we know that if you want to win election, you don't need to have 51% of support. And actually, Justin Trudeau won his election with 38% of support. So you just have to be out there and to speak about what you believe. And i like maybe uh, to speak about the anecdote that is a real one when I was running for the Conservative Party of Canada to be the leader of the Conservative Party two years ago. 
a Muslim organization in Toronto called my team and said, you know, we have questions for every candidate for the leadership and he didn't come. And we have a lot of our members that are Muslim, but also members of the Conservative Party of Canada, 5,000 of them, and they will have to vote to choose a new leader of your party. We had every, every candidate that came and answer our question, but he didn't come. I said, okay, I'll be there. I was the last one, went to Toronto, I had an interview with them, and they asked me a lot of questions. And at the end, the lady said, that's the most important question, Mr. Bernie. If you want to take your time to take about the answer, take your time. It's the most important question for us because our members will look at that question to decide for which leader, for which candidate they will vote. If you don't have the answer right now, you can go back to Ottawa and write your answer back. I said, my God, what is the question? <laughs> <laughs> and at the end, she asked me the question. She said, what will you do for the Muslim community? And I look at her, that's it. She said, yes. And I look at her, nothing. I will do nothing for the Muslim community. I will do nothing for the Jewish community. I will do nothing for the Christians community. But I will do everything to you, for you, as a Canadian. Because for me, you are a Christian. support or the support of the Muslim community over there. I'm looking at them not as a Muslim community, as Canadians, and that's important. That's our way to do politics. And I think that's a, a big difference with us and the other leaders. So what they are, when they're dealing with ethnic community, they call that uh, reaching out, you know? That's their term, not pandering, but reaching out. <laughs> yeah, but I'm doing that. I was with the... Uh, the Canadian from Chinese origin in Toronto two weeks ago. And I was telling them everything that I'm telling you right now. And nothing special for them, because for me, they are Canadians. And that's the most important. Thank you. And it was, uh, I gotta tell you, it was so awesome. Uh, all everybody came from across the country, brand new candidates that were running, and a lot of the people had never been involved in politics before. About sixty percent of them. Yeah, and, and I'm telling you, uh, we we were in the convention center in Gatineau at the at the casino convention center, and we had a uh, they put us through some uh, just a little bit of private stuff in the convention, and we went into some schooling. Like they put us in and said, you know, how to deal with the media, do this, do that. And we had some really good speakers. And it was awesome to see the type of people that were coming. There were people who were running as candidates 